Um, because as, as I mentioned to a few people before, and as Richard knows very well, we're actually in the middle of our ANS project. We're not actually uh, completed our project. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yep, excellent. Um, so I, at, at first I thought, you know, I've actually come into the ENS project in the middle. I actually started probably at VU 12 months ago and it uh, had been proposed by the former research director at Victoria University. And the project was underway slightly before he'd left and actually was, was taken on board by a project manager, Terry Dentry, at Victoria University for a while and then I came on board uh, a number of months into it. Um, now, I believe some of the aspirations of the project at Victoria University were around open access, uh, trying to promote more the open access access to data as well as results in the university. And that was something that the research office, uh, which is where the project was run out of, was actually very keen to see happen as well as the library who was involved in the project. Um, there were also aspirations around establishing a, a kind of a data assets uh, registry or repository at the university at the start of things. And there was a kind of a vision that we would actually have um, seamless metadata, a kind of seamless metadata continuum across this kind of repository. That people would actually be registering data sets and that we would be collecting the metadata that we needed to help them facilitate in the management of the data. and towards some sort of continuing towards ANS at the end where you actually say, well, actually, we're, we're willing to promote this data set now and make it open access. So I think those are some of the visions in the early project. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how it kind of unfolded and then after that talk about some of the things that happened as it unfolded. And then at the end, I'll talk about some of the lessons learned in retrospect, I guess, um, even though we haven't actually completed yet things that we would have done uh, differently or should have considered earlier, I guess is a way I should actually say. Uh, so in the early days, I believe, before I'd come on board, we had done a bit of an analysis to actually say what sort of systems are available out there, what are other universities looking at. Uh, we didn't want to completely go it alone. We thought it would be good to you know, follow the pack and actually come up with a solution that could be uh, supported to some extent. And we'd identified that the Vitro system, or Vivo or Vivo Web, uh, which is the route that Melbourne University and I believe subsequently Griffith University had gone, uh, was actually the, the solution that we, we chose to do. Uh, we knew that Versi, the Victorian New Research Strategic Initiative, had some expertise in that because they'd been helping Melbourne on that particular project as well. Um, so that actually helped us set up uh, some of the technical side of that and we're actually hosting an instance of uh, Vitro for us in the early days. Uh, and that was really good. We also looked out there at what other people were doing in terms of collecting the metadata that was required, the information for ANS, and identified that Monash was uh, way ahead of the pack in terms of collecting that information. So we had adopted uh, the Monash research uh, data management form in that case. Uh, and in addition to that, we'd adopted, I think, a model that had come from Monash where we had pre been presenting to the researchers to say, look, here are the three different sorts of ways that you can make your data available. There's an open access model uh, where you say, we just provided open access with some licensing around it, potentially. Um, there's a restricted access model where we might actually have some restrictions around it, only available for research or only available under certain conditions. Um, and th there would be a negotiated access model where uh, there would have to be some sort of a form of contact and then some sort of discussion about how that data was going to be used or the conditions around how it would be used. Uh, now, we had in the early days identified through the research office, it's great working in the research office, you've got access to a lot of information, about 20 researchers out there or 20 research groups which we thought could be very good to help us uh, start collecting those data sets that we needed to get up there in the research data commons. Uh, and the target number of data sets that we had were 50 um, at Victoria University. Uh, and the project team uh, was a fairly small team at first. It was mostly just a project manager that sat within the research office, uh, a kind of a data analyst who was a slightly more technical person sitting within the research office. Uh, and we also had liaised with the library a little bit in, in the early days on the project. Um, and now, kind of halfway through the project, when I had come on board, uh, we were in a position that we had started to look at the university policy 
as well around research data management. Uh, so there was quite a bit of work done on developing the policy for research data management in parallel to this project, but trying to keep our, uh, the, the ANS project in mind as well as good data management practice and the Australian Code for Responsible Conduct of Research, obviously. So what had happened, we, when we found that we were going to talk to researchers, uh, quite a lot of them were quite reluctant. Um, I think we had hit them with the word open access first, uh, which was probably a little bit scary for many of them. Um, and we'd actually found that many of them had said um, that the ethics around their project said no, no way we could do that. In fact, they were required uh, to destroy the data after X number of years, uh, which was not really what the Australian Code of Responsible Conduct Research had said, but that was the impression that they'd gotten either from the ethics forms that we had in the place or through just uh, some kind of social understanding of, of what you needed to do for a research project. So fairly early on, we actually thought, um, look, we actually should go and talk to the ethics uh, committees about this, just to try and understand you know, what's happening there. Uh, let's just get some kind of uh, buy-in, if we can, from the ethics committee around the ANS uh, principles, around putting things in the research data comment and actually try and understand where this is coming from that you have to destroy it. Is that actually coming from the ethics committees? Uh, and in doing so, we were quite surprised. We talked to them about the ANS project, um, and we talked to them about, um, in some sense, the open access movement and where ANS had come from. Um, and it, we, we actually got a very positive result. And many of the committee members had actually said, uh, look, we actually think it's eth unethical not to share data that's come under ethics projects if you do it in the right way. Uh, the reality is it's less ethical to have to repeat the studies on human or animal subjects uh, than it is to actually share the results, uh, so it, which is a fabulous uh, result. We actually thought, well, that, excellent. They're actually saying that the ANS process or the ANS principles of sharing data is, is a good one. And they had not understood at all that the researchers were thinking they must destroy things after a seven year, after a five year period. Um, so I think since then we've actually managed to change the ANS form. Um, oh, sorry, not the ANS form, the ethics form that we have at the university to state that um, you need to retain the data for a five year period, um, but you need to think carefully about evaluation of that data at that five year period, not immediately jump to the conclusion that everything needs to be destroyed. Uh, we also have questions in there about are they going to be sharing uh, their data with other researchers and what are the processes that they're going to do around that. Now I don't say that we've got that perfect at the moment, but it actually takes quite a long time to talk to ethics committees um, because it's one of these back and forth things where they only meet every every three months at VU, the main ethics committee. Um, and we have to actually propose something to them. They come back with a number of questions and concerns. We go back and forth. And we're kind of still in that process, actually, to some extent. Um, but I think that has actually given a lot of the researchers here some confidence that we are actually talking to the Ethics Committee. The ENDS process is not separate from that. Um, so we're very mindful of uh, inappropriate use of data, I guess, um, or inappropriate sharing of data. Um, and that the ethics committee is aware of what we're, we're trying to do and in principle agrees with what we're trying to do. So we found that really quite useful. Uh, now, in engaging with the 20 researchers, we end up with a conversion rate of, most of them were positive, I have to say. All, almost all of them were, were really supportive of the project. But in the end, the 20 researchers that we interviewed converted into five data sets. five data sets and look, it took quite a lot of effort to actually organise uh, and go through these interviews with the researchers and sometimes there was more than one interview that we had to go through to get some of what we wanted. Um, so scaling up the five is to 20 to 50 is to what, 200. <laughs> we quickly realised that actually that we're not going to have enough resources to actually go out there and do 200 interviews. Um, and in fact, we'd quickly run out of researchers if we did that, because VU being a small institution. Uh, so we had to, had to think differently about, about how that occurred. Um, now, I'll, I'll talk about that in the lessons learned at the end about where we are at the moment about uh, 
trying to get over the line, trying to get over that, that distance uh, with the records. So in, in addition to that, we also realised at the same time that the vitro system that we had chosen uh, required a level of technical capability and capacity and a level of cost involved in that uh, that we couldn't actually sustain here at VU uh, beyond the period of the project. Um, so I think that's something that's really quite important to think about from the start. Um, so we actually had come up with a, a slightly more simple solution, um, which was uh, a form, basically, on, on a very simple on WordPress, pretty much. And we were actually had this, uh, for a short period of time, a bit of an idea where we actually use that and then transfer it into Vitro and then transfer it into ANS. Uh, since that time, we actually done another analysis and went out there and looked at what other universities were using, uh, what is it that we could su support and sustain in the long term, and are other universities supporting and sustaining it, uh, and then come to the conclusion that, look, Vitro probably was the best choice at the time. Um, however, if we, in retrospect, keep all those things in mind, they're actually we, we couldn't identify a choice at the moment that was over and above the very simple system that we currently had, uh, pretty much. So uh, I'll, I'll show people uh, an image of what that looks like later, if if you're interested. Um, now, uh, I, what else have I got written down here? I've written down some notes. So now, in using the form. We developed this form using an online system, and we based it on uh, the form, the research data management form that we'd obtained from Monash. And we'd found that we ended up having a lot of difficulty. Um, well, in, in the first instance, the re getting the researchers to, to put the information in was, was kind of OK for the, the five that we ended up getting. Uh, but then we actually had to try and get that into a format that actually kind of looked OK once it came through ANS and then out onto RIFCS and out onto Research Data Australia's website. And we ended up doing quite a lot in the early days of massaging of the information that we got from the researchers to try and get it into the right format and present it in a way that kind of came out looking OK on ANS. Um, and then we actually had to work through the, the quality uh, process for, with ANS as well to, to ensure that the information that we were putting in was kind of, kind of met their quality control. Um, so th this took quite a long time. And I think one of the things that we learned from that process is that um, sometimes taking somebody else's form is not necessarily the best way to go. <laughs> um, I think that you know, we would have been better off actually having worked backwards from ANS and RIFCS to some extent, how we wanted it to look, uh, then rather than starting out with something that we thought was you know, slightly better in terms of research data management. Um, so, OK, yeah. So that, that's basically about it. Now, in terms of lessons learned, I think, um, one of the things I think we've learned from this is that we should have been looking at the endpoint first. We should have been trying to understand what, what do we hope to get out of the ANDS uh, project, and I think that we've come to an understanding that what we really want to get out of this is not just the outputs of the project, but we would actually like a sustainable service to come out of this to attempt to help our researchers do whatever it is that it, that it does. So one of the things we have to identify is what is the value of that service? Um, is, is it about having a repository? Do the researchers care about that? Uh, is it about open access? Because that didn't seem to fly, really. Um, but what we kind of got to the point of when looking to researchers, and you can, I think you can see there on, on the screen at the moment, if you go to, the, to our e-research support site, uh, one of the actual things that we, we actually had a bit of traction for that particular service was about the promotion of data. So a, a value of sticking your information into Research Data Australia is that you are promoting your work, you're promoting yourself, and you are promoting the existence of that data set. Uh, that can lead to interdisciplinary collaborators coming to you and saying, hey, I'd really like to work with you on that data set. And that doesn't mean that they steal it, that it's open access, um, that they're just using your work and running with it. That means that they may have to contact you and collaborate with you. So further opportunities for more projects, more funding, more papers, more outputs, uh, and greater connections within the research community within Australia. So that, that is the shape of the service that we would like to provide here at Victoria University. And it's an optional service. It's not something that we're actually saying researchers need to actually subscribe to this. But we will promote it as being something valuable for an avenue for facilitating collaboration.
Um, in terms of getting over the line on the number of uh, data sets that we need to put into Research Data Australia to complete the project, uh, we had to start to think outside of the box. Um, we weren't going to get it through the interview process with the resources and the time that we had. So um, in thinking about it, we, we should have actually engaged with the library a lot earlier on in the project, I think. Um, but for a few reasons, we hadn't we run out of the research office. Um, but in engaging with the library, I think it has been a, a very valuable thing for us to do. Uh, we are now looking at the special collections that we actually have in the library as being a, a great range of things that are multi-purpose, cross-discipline, high value, uh, and we, some of the things that we actually have here at Victoria University are quite unique. Uh, so those will be the next round of things that we put up in Research Data Australia, there's quite a lot of those. Uh, in talking with some of the local researchers here, we have a university archive, um, which is quite separate from the library. Uh, but our researchers have discovered a number of valuable research collections inside the archive, so that will be one of my uh, future jobs to actually go into the archive and see what we can identify as research collections. Um, and, and as I said before, you know, engaging with the library very valuable because they're out there, they're also helping some people in faculty set up uh, collections, which is great. Uh, and something we trialled but we haven't seen come to fruition yet, is that we have a number of internal grant schemes. Um, and working in the research office, we have some control over that. So we factored in to the rules for uh, the, the current round of internal grant schemes uh, that the outcomes, uh, in terms of research data sets, have to be registered in Research Data Australia, the rules. Uh, now, we haven't actually seen the the outcomes of that yet, but I think we will eventually, and that will probably be something that we continue to do. Um, so that's an area that we have had some control over. Um, an area which we don't have control over and never will, I think, being a uh, university that does an awful lot of industry engagement, uh, a lot of our funding is commercial funding uh, or sector funding that isn't public funding, uh, and because of that, the ability for us to open access out all of our data sets is just is, is just not feasible. So, uh, but our internal grant schemes are publicly funded, so therefore we can actually set the rules there. Um, oh, sorry, I'll just kill that. Um, okay, what what else do I want to talk about? Um, now, in addition, we we had thought in our aspirations, if you recall. Uh, attempting to have this kind of repository of data at, at the university and having this continuum of metadata that uh, goes from current management or planning all the way through to, to the end project. And while I think that's still a good aspiration, one of the, the things that we've learned, as, as I mentioned, working backwards from ANS, the RIFCS, is that that's actually extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult. And you need metadata that's fit for purpose. I mean, the metadata that's fit for purpose in RIFCS is about presenting yourself or possibly even promoting yourself in Research Data Australia or, and representing the data set and the project around it. Uh, and that's information fit for public and human consumption. A lot of the information that we found through developing the research data management policy uh, in order to do uh, in uh, to do integral research data management on, on campus to make sure that the data sets that we have, we know that they're under ethics, we know whether or not there are contracts or restrictions around them, we know about how long they need to be kept for, uh, who's in control and, and what are the processes we need to put in place and are there soft special software you need to know. A lot of that information, we want to try and make a minimal impact on the researcher when recording that and that means that the information is not fit for public consumption when it gets uh, all, all said and done. We want to. We want actual notes, pretty much in there. We don't want a uh, paragraph. Uh, so those two ends of the spectrum of the metadata continuum, I guess, have diverged uh, and not converged. So the research data registry, which we're looking at implementing, will be a longer process at VU um, because it will actually be more of an enterprise um, asset, I guess. Uh, than the end service. Um, and the sorts of metadata that we're looking at putting in there are not the sorts of metadata that we're looking at putting into ends at the moment. 
So that's just what we found anyway, that trying to roll those two requirements together uh, may have been more of a burden and may have actually extended the ENDS project out even further. Um, finally, I think, again, don't estirate, underestimate the amount of effort that it takes to actually uh, get some of the, the data sets that you need into the end system. Um, having the perfect IT system doesn't help. Uh, you've got to get out there and talk to people. You have to form alliances with other like-minded parts of the university. Uh, if you're running it through the library, form an alliance with the research office. If you're doing it through the research office, which I think might be a little bit unusual, I'm not sure, form an alliance with the library. Uh, talk to IT early on about what it is that you can support and sustain in the long term. Um, and don't underestimate the value of support you can get from e-research groups around the place, your state e-research body, because uh, we've had quite a bit of help on the technical side of things with Versi, uh, the Victorian E-Research Strategic Initiative. And um, those are some of the sorts of things that we couldn't have done in-house, or if we had of it would have taken us uh, quite a lot longer. Um, and so I think that's probably about all I have to say. Do we want to turn other people's microphones back on? <laughs> Are there questions coming through or something? Or? Um. Yeah. So we have a few people here. Uh, actually, someone's mentioned also research ambassadors. We have at Victoria University, um, we're, we're actually investigating in terms of uh, e-research service promotion in general, how do we get the messages out there? Because global emails are just frustrating for everybody. Um, and one of the mechanisms we're investigating is effectively around kind of almost social connections. And we have a group of people that we hire who are later year uh, top PhD students. Uh, and they actually do a lot of support. Um, they're hired through the library. Uh, and they're called research ambassadors, and they support both researchers and research students at Victoria University. So making them aware about Research Data Australia has been a strategy that we have here, so they're able to actually talk to researchers about it. If somebody comes to them with a data set, um, they can say, hey, have you thought about promoting your data set in Research Data Australia? And here are some of the other VU data sets in Research Data Australia. Here's what it looks like. Here are some of the benefits. Um, so that's one area we're investigating. Now I've got another question here. Will VU Research Data Registry have more or less metadata than Research Data Australia? Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure if I understand that. Will VU Research Data Registry have more or less metadata than Research Data Australia? Uh, it, it's actually quite different. The, the metadata that we want, there are some overlaps. Um, but in actually going through what it is that we thought we would need in terms of being able to manage and maintain the data in the long term, uh, we found it to be quite different. Research Data Australia, I think the purpose uh, is a bit different. It's about uh, discovery, understanding the value of what's in the metadata. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share with people what we've come up with in terms of uh, a, a, for, a pro forma for that. There are overlaps, but really what we want is that re every, we want everybody to fill in uh, what metadata they, we have in the research data registry. Um, and because of that, we really want quick answers. We don't want you to put into human readable terms what sorts of data sets in there. We want you to say uh, this data, that data, that data, that data, what's the location? Uh, do I have a catalog somewhere for these sorts of things? Um, do I need to retain these for integrity or don't I? Um, are these just interim data sets? How long do I need to retain it for? Um, so it's it's probably more structured information, I guess, in that respect. Does that answer the question? So a question, are researchers at VU using discipline-specific metadata schemas in addition to RIFCS? Um, I'd be shocked if they weren't, frankly. Um, we're not, we're not trying to integrate those things, I think. Um, and we're actually not even trying, we're, we're not really considering offering services to support that at the moment. I think we will be. 
Um, the research data registry that we will provide probably will not, in the first instance, also support discipline schemas. Um, we would probably hope that they will need their own systems to support those discipline schemas. It'll just be the minimum that we need to support to have a registry that helps us with our research data management procedures at the university and faculty and school level. Can you expand on the role of the library in your project? Ah, okay. In the early days, the, the library, we, we just had a kind of liaise with them, I think, for a while, and, and they weren't really sure what their role in the project was. Um, and now we actually have an e-research uh, librarian that does some of the research data uh, for me, and she comes over quite frequently and has actually worked on some of the technical aspects of the project. That's been really good. Um, we also are using the library not just in terms of the special collections which are sitting within the library, so they're actually entering, they're providing some of the collections, uh, but we're using them as uh, almost team members to help us actually source extra data sets out there. So I think you know we've gone from a point where we should have been including them more to a point where they're actually far more engaged uh, in the project and actually helping in that in developing the back end to, to do the, the connection from our online form into uh, the RIFCS at the machine to machine level. Um, can you explain a lot? Okay. Can you tell us more about how you set up the system with internal grant scheme? Which departments were involved? Uh, the research office, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, so it, an advantage of actually running the project out of the research office is that we can actually make those decisions with, you know, some approval from the PVCR, um, who sits immediately above us. So I think it was actually fairly easy. It may have been maybe more difficult if you were running your research your and seeing the Commons project not out of the research office. I missed a question from Herb and Sue. Okay, I'll scroll back up. How successful was adding conditions to the internal grants? Oh, yet to see the results of that. Uh, it was a mandatory requirement uh, if they produced data sets as a result. Uh, of course, there's always the chance that they will just not mention the fact that they've produced data sets. That can occur. Um, and we haven't seen the fruits of that yet because they had just kind of started this year. Uh, now, I believe some of them may be close to getting to a finishing point, so we need to follow up on that. Uh, are people interested in seeing the online form that we've actually come up with? It's actually fairly simple. So this is the online form. This is just a WordPress that we actually have. At the moment, it's cloud-hosted. Um, we'll have to actually bring it back into VU. Um, and I'm logged in as an administrator, so I can see some of the administrative uh, aspects of the form. Um, it's fairly simple. We have information about people involved, um, the project details, um, some basic information about the collection, um, how might people access that data set, are there related publications involved, uh, uh, I, we, had, we end up getting a, uh, a kind of a default university copyright statement. Now, I should also mention, um, that, that just reminds me, that we had to talk with the, the legal team for a while because we tried to understand, you know, what's, what are the possible implications of putting things up in the ANDS uh, registry and also of actually putting a copyright effectively on things that researchers may potentially not own Eventually, we got down to a very, very simple solution, which was there is a, a field in this form called list external people or organizations who must be contacted before granting access or copies. Um, that's what the legal team had said. Um, and that, that for us is just a flag that goes that does not go into ends. Uh, if anybody types anything in that box, that flags us within the research office uh, to say, look, we have to double check that the copyright on that is okay, it's correct, 
uh, that we that the researchers have actually had permission to be able to put that up in the ends. We've got to do a bit more work, basically, a bit more groundwork. Uh, but it was a very simple solution of of just saying, look, if these people have identified an external organisation who's involved, the standards for your copyright may not apply because it may be a collaborative piece. Um, and they may or may not have sought permission to be able to put that up into the ANS registry uh, and we need to double check. Um, but if there are no external people or organisations involved uh, and our default policy says that the VU owns the data set, therefore um, we can apply the VU ownership and copyright and um, in principle can allow it to go up. Is this form open to other institutions to see or only available to uh, VU staff? Uh, at the moment, it's only available to VU staff, and uh, but we can actually probably make it open at some point um, if people are interested. I can actually send around a... Uh, probably I can save it as a HTML file or something, perhaps, I think. Or maybe I can print it to PDF. That might actually be better because it is a dynamic form. It kind of may not save properly. Um, yeah, and, and I'm just being reminded by the staff there that we were written up in uh, one of the ANS guides uh, around ethics, where they're talking about what a, a number of the universities are doing around ethics. Uh, so uh, just a bit of a plug to go and have a look at the guide if you're interested in engaging with your ethics people early at your university. That's about it. Any other questions? I'll also mention that you know this this form has evolved. So it did actually, as I mentioned, start out looking an awful lot more like the the Monash form. Um, but because so much massaging was required by hand to get that into RIFCS, we thought, look, we're better off just to ask for what it was that we actually need to get it into RIFCS if we're going to make this a sustainable service that doesn't require an awful lot of people's time to keep going. If we're going to just do some brief. Uh, checking of the quality of the information on top of it. And very happy to share this form with anybody. But um, I think you'll hear that from almost all of us here in Commons projects. Many people will say, look, very happy to share with you any of the material we've provided, we've produced, uh, any of the technical solutions we've produced. So. Uh, Lyle, I think there was a question from Rebecca Parker that I'm not sure you answered. Oop. Sorry, Beck, did I miss one? Where is it? Have researchers filled this in yet? I'd be curious to know how they went with it. Yeah, a few of them have filled it in, um, and we've had feedback from every single one of them. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's actually gone reasonably well. We've got it to the point where we think that most of the questions are clear now, um, and there are a few buggy things. One of the things we found tricky was that our organisation, like everyone, is in a state of flux in terms of uh, faculties and schools. And keeping maintaining that list of information was just going to be an absolute nightmare. But having worked with ANS, I think we've come up with a solution. So that will change slightly uh, the way that we do that. Um, but other than that, I think we're at the stage where almost all of it's fairly straightforward. And we put a lot of explanation and help text around it as well. Are there any? One of the things. Sorry, are there I any should mention. There? Sorry, one of the things, Beck, that um, has been an issue is where we've found some areas that have lots of uh, collections, like the library, for example, and they would probably have a lot of information in that form that would be in common. Uh, they wanted a way that they didn't have to type it in all over again. <laughs> Um, and there was no real default way to do that within the system. Turns out in the back end of the system, if they create one of them, we can create replicas uh, and then they can go in and fix the other versions. So that was just something we had to do. Sorry, Did somebody.
Everybody's unmuted if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask Lyle. No. Well. No. Okay. Thank you for listening. Hopefully some of that was useful. Oh, thank you very much, Lyle.